<laughs> but uh, anyway, that was just what I was wondering about the activist, the activist aspect of this campaign about about how the no how the no campaign will really do that, how they will deliver that if it's going to be door to door, and that's going to be the critical factor. And not I think you've got a real problem, you know, because uh, the Labour Party people on the left too. I have a lot of respect for people, and I really do think that the tone of this really. The, the yes campaign really has to work hard at having a positive and respectful tone and that isn't always evident on Twitter for example and I think it's really counterproductive but I do think that the Labour activists who consider themselves on the left definitely their main argument is essentially that the old that I've heard it so many times that, that Working class people in Scotland have as much in common with people in Manchester, Newcastle, Liverpool, blah, blah, blah. And almost that Scottish voters have a responsibility not to leave their working class voters in England bereft and alone to, to deal with the South East Tory vote. And that, that is a, they've got a really, really big problem because their alternative is essentially the possibility of socialism being delivered by Westminster. Mm. And it's just, it's fantasy land. It's pie in the sky. There is no evidence for it. Absolutely no evidence for it. Now, that might not be the Labour Party leadership's arguments, but it's certainly the arguments of left activists in the Labour Party. And mm. they're going to really struggle convincing left-wing working-class voters in Scotland that that Westminster will deliver that. Mm. Can I actually ask Carolyn a question? Because I was I was being sneaky and I was looking at your your listing exercise in Women for Independence by by masquerading as a woman. Oh, where um, you? I was. I didn't. I should say I didn't submit it. I was not though. I, I didn't. I didn't submit a, a spurious uh, a spurious uh, questionnaire. But I was quite interested in how detailed it was. You have lots uh -huh. of it. In the first part, it was very much broken down by demographics. It asked about a whole range of sort of personal features from religion, I think, uh, sexuality. I wondered, wh wh why was that? I don't know if you were involved in the, 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 yeah, the formation of this. I, w I, I wasn't, I didn't advise all the questions. I, I, I was consulted in some of the questions. We forget various working groups and Women for Independence. Uh, the, the idea of it is really to try and get as much a, a detailed view as possible about what was motivating women, what concerns women, and what that the relationship of that is to their uh, attitude towards independence, to, and to see if there are any themes or um, common denominators that would allow us then when we move into a campaigning phase um, after a very long listening phase that would make our campaigning more effective. Because mm -hmm. I'm just interested to hear that because I am I am I have some cephalogical and polling based fixations which materialise now and then. And one of the things which really strikes me is that we know that the gender gap in support for independence in terms of polling is is between what ten uh -huh. and fifteen percent. But we don't know much more than more that. More than that, no. We, it's That's, it's just, mm -hmm. just gender blocks. It's not a question of yeah. class or geography it, or all of those considerations. It's it's fairly it, that's fairly typical in terms of how women's issues inverted commas are treated. It's all homogenised. It's all grouped together. There's no really there hasn't been as far as I'm aware very much detailed research or even commentary into what's actually going on with women um, and why. And I think John Curtis wrote something recently. Yeah. Um, that was just ridiculous um, and stereotyped women yet again. Never. John Curtin. <laughs> so, and uh, Fiona, who's second name I can't remember just now, from Edinburgh University, who tweets as gender poll, did a very good response to that. But um, I'm not aware that there's even much academic research being done. And um, I would hope that it is being done now that might help to inform uh, what's going on. But So that's why Women for Independence decided we were going to do it ourselves, because nobody else was asking, nobody else was listening, nobody else was attempting to respond to this gap that must be about something. It might be about many things, but we, we, we want to understand it and then hopefully bridge that gap. No, that's entire. I mean, just on just to briefly on that academic point, um, that's absolutely right. In fact, if you just want to study gender in Scotland or Scottish manifestations mm -hmm. of gender, you, you in fact, if you get, if you go through the whole gamut of social research literature, you find bits and pieces. But we've got such crude images and crude accounts of gender in Scotland, which is undifferentiated often by geography, 
whose accounts of masculinities are limited to, in general terms, the Glasgow hard man, who is ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. We don't really have a, a nuanced discussion or anything even approaching a nuanced discussion about gender in Scotland. Um, and, and it's not perhaps surprising, therefore, that these kind of questions are quite difficult to talk about because we've not had that conversation yet. Um, no, it's, it's not been prioritised, certainly not by mainstream media or academia. I mean, there are pockets and there, there are women who valiantly struggle, um, but it's always a struggle. That's the, that's the problem. It is always a struggle, which was partly why I wasn't there on Saturday, because I'm probably a bit jaded and a bit cynical and a bit traumatised still by those struggles on the left, particularly mm. to uh, make women's concerns and politics uh, and rights at the, the forefront of discussion and sensibilities um, and sensitivities and you know and, ju and just just to even stop the the routine discrimination in sexist language would mm. be a huge step forward. One, one mm. of the things that was really interesting Caroline about Saturday was and I think this relates to um, the generation shift was that mm -hmm. a younger a younger generation of women just just would assume equality and parity in a way, and that was really evident in terms of the balance of speakers and the balance of platforms and who was organising it. Basically, this was organised by lots of young women yeah. uh, as part part of the whole team, and I think that that really shifted the whole tone of it, which was really exciting. Yeah, no, that I think that's good. I think that from what I heard about the workshop, women and independence. The, there was a discussion, though, about an understanding of patriarchy without wanting to get too bogged down in, in these issues, because I know that this podcast isn't just about that, but having a discussion about patriarchy and what it means for men and women and for that to be up front and centre, as up front and centre as Marxism might be, for example, on the on the left, that's where we want, that's where we want to be. It's no side issue. I think that's right, and it's. Um, I mean, and again, it's it's such a pity that 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 there are conversations about many of these issues. I mean, if we think about major major women issues that do make it into the Scottish public sphere, we talk about women prisoners, we talk about domestic abuse, and that's entirely right, and they're really important questions to talk about. But I, I, my feeling is that there's often a tendency to regard these as sort of women's issues, not to yeah. see them as issues about men. And if we're going to yeah. change society, we have to change men, uh, yeah. not women. Um, Definitely. And and I think that's that's the really big challenge to, to go on to yourself, me. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, always finish on a high note. So, did you all see the Better Together flyer this week uh, that everyone thought was actually an independence flyer? I have to admit, I thought it was when I first saw it. I don't know if you saw it. The... Wait, was I this didn't the, see yeah. it. I heard about it. Was uh, this was this the the the, the, the real wee ticket? Yes, yeah. they basically handed out. Uh, they were in the train station <laughs> handing out a train ticket that said, uh, "Okay, I've got it here. Uh, from United Kingdom to Independence, one-way ticket, terms non-refundable, adult children, all, all." And, uh, Excellent. They, yeah, they all were, aboard. Yeah, yeah. They were <laughs> given. <laughs> this is supposed to. And then underneath, the only way you'd know it was better together is they've got better together dot net. But I, I, at first glance, I actually thought it was a pro indie flyer. So like, go on yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you saw it. It's quite funny. I'll stick it on the on the podcast page. But uh, yeah. Mike, Mike, did you see it? What would you think of it? Yeah, fantastic. They're, they're really doing a great job there, aren't they? And it was actually it was stolen from an old. Um, SNP youth idea actually, so it was a, a rehash of a of a pro independence uh, idea. It's extraordinary. Well done. Yeah, great. <laughs> I think it actually it, what it illustrates though is the dangers of any or campaign um, or organisation to see the world as they see it and think yeah. that the rest of the world sees it that way because they're obviously producing that on the assumption that the people they're handing it out to will see it as a bad thing. No, that's yeah. that's absolutely right. That and and I was I was having a go at this week about I don't know if anyone's seen it, but the various of the uh, online nationalists and some of the SNP MSPs, I must say, have got into the habit of tweeting about being bitter together, which mm -hmm. I just think is just dire. It's just yeah. dire because it convinces no one that doesn't already hold all of your convictions Definitely. and i think we're going to have to be so disciplined about about avoiding insulting people because who wants to i mean if we're going to have to convince people who have been in favor of the union for much of their political mm -hmm. life 
to change their mind and you don't do that by calling them definitely bitter. i was accused of being naive for making that very point and it might not be that you necessarily want to be polite or respectful to the person that you're having a discussion with who might be in the better together camp and you might have all sorts of reasons for being quite um suspicious or bitter towards that particular individual or or group but it's not necessarily just about the conversation you're having with them. It's about the people watching you having the conversation with them. And if you're really seriously trying to persuade people who are undecided or cynical and suspicious about politics in general and who aren't interested, then they really don't want to watch people being nasty to each other. They, no it's way. just a total turn off. No, I think that's right. I think that's right. Okay, well, and I on think, that, maybe should yeah, we close yeah. off there, perhaps, on that yeah, on that right. positive note of comedy <laughs> and, and, and call for civility in our public discourse. Well, one of my very, very favourite. We've, <laughs> we've all been quite friendly today, so... That's a good well, thing. Yeah, okay, so we'll leave it there, and just to tell you, we should have another Scottish Independence podcast later in the week, and we'll be back to our normal time of Sunday for the for that podcast next episode, I hope. Okay, so thanks, uh, thanks to Mike. Bye. Thanks to Andrew, as usual. Thank you. And thanks to Carolyn. Thank you. Goodbye. All the best. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Rest up in your books, man. Keep a cool